I saw you on Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee with Jerry Seinfeld, mm -hmm. and I felt like you hated it. I didn't hate it. Sebastian Maniscalco is a world-class comedian. Netflix specials galore, has toured the entire world with his comedy skill set. We have a great podcast for you where we have a conversation about him being a hypochondriac, the value of having a DO as your personal physician. He actually has a brand new Netflix special, Is It Me, live right now. Highly recommend you check that out. Let's get started. Be whoop. How's your health? Uh, I have sciatic pain running down my right leg. Right now? Yes. Uh, it's not painful right now. It tends to act up and flare up uh, after a night of sleep and throughout the day. It's been okay. going on for a year and a half. Wow. And any successes with any treatments thus far? Um, I No. Yeah. I have done physical therapy, not consistently though. Okay. I've done uh, any every type of massage you could think of. Sure. Cupping. Uh, what's the pins? Acupuncture. Acupuncture. Uh, epidural. You had an epidural. It's that bad. Twice. Wow. Nothing. And not helping. I have spinal stenosis. So is surgery on the horizon? I hope not. Uh, I'm going to take care of this seriously after today because I've been on the road for 19 months. Wow. And it's time <laughs> to correct my legs. <laughs> Do you, you, so when you say correct your legs, you're having like muscle weakness? My right calf is, is, is fading. Fading. Wow. Why? Can you help me? I, I probably can. I mean, I'm here to promote the special. I, I might walk out of here with calf movement. <laughs> what the? That's a surprise at the end of the episode. <laughs> calf movement. Love it. Um, no, I'm an, I'm an osteopathic physician. Have you ever seen a DO before or yeah. heard of a DO? A DO? Yeah. No. There are two types of doctors in the United States, licensed, MDs and DOs. Okay. Um, same four years of medical school, same residency training. DOs tend to be a little bit more hands-on and holistic in their approach, meaning that they believe the body has an innate ability to heal itself. And our job is to not get in the way, but still give medicine, surgeries, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But that principle is more strong in our education. Although to be honest, everything's merging now. Okay. Yeah, like it started off that way because if you rewind a hundred years ago in medicine, the shit MDs were doing because they were the only doctors, like bloodletting, creating blisters to heal infections. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, George Washington died because doctors were like, let's bleed him out. Let's make him puke and shit and we'll fix his pneumonia. And instead he died. Wow, I didn't know that. So DOs came about and they're like, we need to chill. And that was the <laughs> right approach. Yeah. But now DOs have realized, hey, there's a lot of value in the MD philosophy and that's why the worlds are kind of coming together. Yeah, I, I kind of I kind of like the DO approach. I've kind of taken that on unbeknownst to me. I didn't know oh, really? it was a, a DO approach. But <laughs> I'm trying to do everything possible not to do surgery. Okay, Wh this. which is the right move, especially when it comes to spinal surgery. Not saying that spinal surgery is wrong in every case, but a lot of times people jump to it or they have an overeager surgeon. And I don't say that to denounce surgeons, but more so to say, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail or it's not. Mm -hmm. So when surgeons see a, a problem and it's been kicked up to the high level of their specialty, they say, I got to operate. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it backfires and the results are not what patients thought it would be. The communication isn't there. So I appreciate that you're trying to push this off. Yes. Yes. And you've tried literally everything. I tried everything. And uh, the next time I see you, I'll probably tell you I had surgery. So <laughs> it's good. I'm going to keep my fingers crossed for that. Have you tried anything out of the box? Anything that traditional medicine would frown upon? Mm, no. No. I no miracle potions, no supplements. No. No. So you're not you're not into the that kind of It's world. not that I'm not into it. I just don't know what miracle potion would make my leg feel better if you walk into any supplement store they'll have a potion for you yeah but like uh <laughs> if you're suggesting that um oh you have you have sciatic sciatica in my refrigerator <laughs> uh, or on my counter next to my feathers i <laughs> call out my feathers i have a beautiful a beautiful potion you can take then yeah. i go oh, okay what, what what is it but no one and i'm surprised no one's pitched that to you no I so you ha you have a good team around you yeah. and good people yeah i i I kind of make my own decisions when it comes to my health. Yeah. Um, I, 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 you know, I talk to people and I kind of come to my own conclusions. Well, like you'll, what in your case oftentimes happens is people start going abroad 
and get questionable treatments, regenerative yeah, yeah. treatments, stem cells. I have no idea where those stem cells come from. Most of the people that get them probably don't either, but they're like, Kobe Bryant did it, RIP. Um, so they're like, if he healed his Achilles, maybe I can heal my knee. That's great if people are doing that. Okay. Me, I come from a Sicilian family. Okay. When I hear I had to go overseas for something, <laughs> I'm thinking pause. Something's wrong. Okay. Fair but uh, I don't know that much about it to really it. comment on. Okay. Well, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if 19 months on the road is a contributing factor, like to the highest degree. Yeah. This this happened prior to me going. I woke up one morning, went to the bathroom, and a shooting pain down my right leg. Now, over the course of time, the pain has kind of migrated also to my left leg, and my right calf has lost strength. Mm. So it's a little concerning for me. I have two young kids, five and three, and I don't want to be the daddy that uh, can't run around with his son uh, on, the, on the soccer field because sure. you know, he didn't take care of his body. So. Yeah. I got to focus now that the tour is over yeah. and hopefully, by the way, sidestep here. Yeah. First time I've ever done a podcast uh -oh. with the host in socks. Oh, no. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. Should, should I put on? Not a bad thing. I could put on a crock. That, that's even worse. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and the producer in slippers. I feel really overdressed for this, man. I, I come in a jacket. You're coming from legit <laughs> television into a dude's apartment, and people are in slippers and socks. No, it's great. This is casual Friday here on a, on a well, Tuesday. Well, we want you to feel comfortable, no, like you're at home, just hanging out. Maybe we missed the mark. No, no, no. So no, I apologize. No, no, no. It's it's not. I feel like I should, you know, take my <laughs> you jacket off. You want to remove your <laughs> shoes or something? By no, all I'm means, good. I wanted you to be comfortable. If I do this in my socks, I lose all credibility. <laughs> well, I know it's also hard to take off the shoes given your calf situation. Yeah, so. yeah, no, it's, it would be a, I want a whole be, thing. I want to be thing. respectful of the calf. Yeah. Um, wow, okay, that was a good pivot. From. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, God, go ahead, go ahead. You, no, you were saying that you're from a Sicilian background and yeah. you're, you have a different philosophy on healthcare. And I've heard you say in the past that it was maybe hypochondriac situation is that true constantly it's 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 gotten a little bit better now than mm. it was before but anytime anything happened to me it was dire yeah this is it i'm dying oh okay right? so like a fatality situation fatality okay yes well, why um, was that the case upbringing Mm, my mother was always worried, always the worry wart, what's going on. We always had like a negative spin on okay. what was going on. So if it was a cough or runny nose, it it, it was made Pneumonia. more of yeah, more of a deal than mm. it actually should. And I've kind of adopted that philosophy now with my kids. Yes. So my kids get a cough or they get a uh that my daughter had pink eye. Oh, okay. So that's it. She's gonna be blind. You know, it's uh, it's that type of yeah, mindset. Yeah. Not the right mindset. Yeah. To have, especially with kids. Yes. Uh, thank God for my wife, who's a lot more calming and a little bit more go with the flow. Do you think your parents and you as parents have swapped roles? Meaning, your mom seemed to be the worrier, and now you're the worrier. Yeah. My dad was never the worrier. It's always been my mom, and my sister's worse than I am. So, wow. uh, okay. yeah, I, uh, I hope to kind of be a little bit more relaxed moving forward. I'm a little bit too. What strategies are you using to get there? Uh, I've tried to meditate, uh, oh, wow. to be more okay. in the present. Uh, and I haven't done that consistently enough to achieve Your what body. I'm trying to achieve. Yeah. Um, and no excuses. It's just, you know, sometimes it's like, it's like anything's with me. It's like, all right, I'm going to get in shape. I do that for a while, I fall out of shape. It's been this back and forth, back and forth. I mean, that's here. human. Like, what excuses? That's real life, especially yeah. with someone of your stature and the time that you're spending working on your craft. How do you balance that as a parent where you're like, I want to be there, I want to succeed, which one comes first? How do I take a break? How do I make sure the fire doesn't go out from the career? Because Hollywood stand-up fickle game, right? Yeah. yeah, it's been a struggle for me. 
Thank God for the pandemic. Although the first seven, eight weeks of the pandemic was really difficult for me because stand up comedy has been my outlet. My, mm. uh, it's been my very therapeutic for me to get on stage and share my thoughts with a group of strangers. And once that was taken away from me, I was like, oh, wow, yeah. I don't I don't have that outlet anymore. Now, uh, I did have two young kids and a, and a beautiful wife to spend time with. However, you know, doing work has always been kind of my salvation. And once it was ripped away from me, I, I, I had to pivot and struggle. I, I, had, I, I was struggling. I, yeah. I, I'm not going to deny it. I, I, was, I was struggling. But uh, silver lining there was I got to see things that I probably wouldn't have saw if I was on the road. I saw my son take his first steps wow. and I spent a lot of time with them. But it is a something that I'm always thinking about. Yeah. I don't want this time to go past, and I'm looking at my kids at 21 years old, going, "What wow. the hell was I doing in Montana yeah. when I should have been home?" So I made a conscious effort to say, "Hey, no more touring. This is it. Uh, not forever, but for for." You know, a reasonable period. For a time where I could spend some time with my kids, maybe do some work locally and some TV or film. But for the most part, I grew up with family being the most important thing, and I, I want to also implement that in my life with my own family. So, yeah, uh, I, I'm always very conscious of it. It's tough because the pandemic took away a lot of coping mechanisms we all had without knowing they were coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm. For you, it was work. That was your outlet. For some people, it was looking forward towards the weekend and getting drinks with their friends. When I remember when I was working long shifts in the ICU, I would say, oh, I can't wait for my vacation, even if it was six weeks away. But the pandemic took all of that away from all of us, and we yeah. had to create new coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And some people thrived with new ones, and some people really struggled. So it was a really messed time, messed up time, especially for us in the hospital system because we're looking and it's like, how do you help people when the resources are limited, our hospital beds are filled, mm -hmm. there's no beautiful comedians helping us smile. It was it was tough. Did you try and find new ways to work from home, like do some kind of unique yeah, I, setup? Yeah, I did. Um, what did I do? Sunday supper. I did this thing with a chef friend of mine okay. who was struggling. And I said, let's get your name out there because he also imports a lot of product. Mm. And I said, let's do a Sunday supper. You cook. I'll provide the entertainment. We'll sell tickets. We'll give the money to charity. And we did it twice. From that spawned a TV show that I did called Well Done on Discovery+. Plus. Wow. So at the time, I didn't think, oh, this is going to be a TV show. I just was helping a buddy. We did it. And boom, we made it a TV show for 13 episodes. Also, I did Zoom shows, not stand-up, because I didn't want to sit there and do stand-up in my living room. <laughs> it was more like this. It was like a mediated conversation okay. where there was a uh, guy asking me questions and you know, over the pandemic, it was, we're going to send you a bar kit, <laughs> yes. right? And you're going to make drinks and we're going to have entertainment. So uh, that's kind of what I did to make a little scratch during the pandemic. Sure. But for the most part, I was at home just bitching and sure, screaming, when this, what is this thing going to end? <laughs> In the beginning, you're like, hate this, love it. And then by the end, were you back to hate it? Uh, yeah, I was kind of ready to kind of go i think listen human beings are made to interact with one another sure. we're supposed to go out we're supposed to make new friends new connections new experiences and when it goes on you know for a year year and a half it's like all right yeah. already come on we need to you know i remember spending a christmas in my yard and my uh sister side of the family was like 30 yards from us so we were on the other side we put the the, the the gifts in the middle and they took them back. Yeah, it's yeah. like, this is how we're spending Christmas. Yeah. And it's like, you want to get together and hug, sing around the tree. Yeah. So sure. Well, rough, rough, uh, rough two years. No, <laughs> it, I was, mean, man. it was, it was, there's no other way to put it. Yeah. Um, now that you have children and you're experiencing the medical world of having kids and taking them to the doctor's office, you also launched a new podcast with a doctor who happens to be a pediatrician. How did that come about? So, um, unfortunately, my daughter, when she was one, went through some respiratory issues wow. and was admitted to the ICU three separate times. Wow. Uh, had trouble breathing, and it, no one could really diagnose what it was. Mm -hmm. So that was frightening. 
And yeah. in doing so, our pediatrician and our family became super close just because he was kind of navigating the waters. Mm -hmm. And uh, we became friends. And he had this idea of doing a podcast because, you know, there's a lot of parents out there that have questions. And sometimes they don't have a pediatrician available to talk with. Of course. And he thought it'd be a great idea to start a podcast where people could call in with their questions. He would give some advice. I would provide some humor and some personal stories. Which is also medicine. Which is also medicine. And uh, at first, I think we were going to call it... Um, Laughter is the best medicine, actually. Oh. But uh, we wanted to make it a little bit more specific. And it's a dad. We're both, we're, we're, we're two fathers. And sometimes at these podcasts, <laughs> when it's male dominated, uh -huh. it's very testosterone driven. Okay. It's like, you know, what, you know, what kind of protein you don't you know, like, <laughs> Or okay. men are talking about success and, you know, you go through Instagram and you go down and there's always this music and mm -hmm. then this guy talking about, if you want to do it, you got to do it. You know, like th this is what, yeah. what, what the what, hustle culture folks, the hustle the culture, a hundred X yeah. philosophy. <laughs> At least this is what I'm getting on my feet. No, this know. is a hundred percent. Everyone's feet. okay. So generally speaking, men don't go out for a drink or go to the game and talk about the struggles that they're dealing mm. with being a father. Very true. Right? So we thought it'd be nice to have a podcast where not only fathers can tune in and call up and go, hey, man, I'm running a, a Fortune 500 company. I'm working 100 hours a week. How do you guys deal with, you know, the similar to the question that mm -hmm. you asked me. Uh, also, it gives women an opportunity to kind of tune in ask questions, but get a male perspective mm. on parenting, which sometimes I think is absent in the podcast space. I'm not saying it's not out there, sure. but I think uh, the ability for people, we had a woman call in from Spain and she hadn't had the ability in her city that she lived in to ask a pediatrician what was going yeah. on with her child. And she sought out our podcast to get some medical advice. So it's like, it's helping people, and, uh, and and that's what I like to do with all my projects. It's not necessarily money-driven or success-driven. It's like, oh, I have an interest in this. I have a passion in this. I've been doing a podcast for nine years with Pete Corielli mm -hmm. called The Pete and Sebastian yep. Show, and we haven't made anything. <laughs> it's it's it, 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 it hasn't been monetized. We don't have any guests. We just love talking to one another. If we make money sure. on the thing, great. great. If not, it's just a passion project. Well, it's a value add. Not everything financial. I mean, not everything valuable has to be financial. Driven, exactly. So yes. That's awesome that you think about it that way. Because as you said, in hustle culture right now, it's crazy. And I think the reason it happens is because those people usually charge the most for their products, whether it's a course, a book, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And as a result they can spend the most on ads and promoting their content. So that's why it gets in front of your eyes. Mm. Is that what it is? Is that that's just is, my is, philosophy? Is that, is that the trick? Well, because if you are a channel on YouTube, let's say, and you do hustle culture stuff on your YouTube channel, the amount of money you get from ads is 10 X what I get as a medical right? channel. And then I get 10 X of what like a jokey channel does. Mm. So like there's, there, that's why I think they're so, omnipresent like just everywhere in your face all the time and also people want it mm -hmm. they seek it out i mean of course if you're struggling you're like how do i get wealthy is probably the number one search term and then i don't know if you feel this way i came up in brooklyn on welfare coming from russia to the united states watching my dad go through medical school for a second time in a new language being very poor and then having my level of success with social media the, the wealth is the least important part or the least valuable part of what it means to be successful. Do you feel that way? Yeah, I think success uh, is determined by, you know, everybody has their own take sure. on it. But mine, when I got into stand-up comedy, wasn't to be famous, wasn't to make money. It was solely because this is the only thing I really enjoy doing. Mm. If I could make money from this, obviously you want to make money to, you know, you know, there's nothing wrong with what, being financially successful. I don't listen. I'm not from this. There's another culture out there that is like, oh, uh, these people make money. These people that are making money, I've always looked at these people coming up going, 
I want to do that. I want to achieve that. Mm -hmm. I never looked at people going, oh, this guy's got so much money. Like Elon Musk, he got a ton of money. I, he didn't take it from me or you. He's, yeah, I don't, he, I don't even know where he took it. <laughs> he's, he's making it. Okay, yeah. So, sure. you know, good for him. I mean, whoever's out there making a living and, and, and being successful, I, I don't despise those people whatsoever. But uh, for me, getting into comedy strictly for the love and passion of performance and wherever that took me, uh, it was going to take me. I, I, I came out to LA in 1998 and I said, listen, I am going to make a living doing stand-up comedy. That was the goal. Anything on top of that has been basically gravy for me. Yeah. I'm going to make a guess and you tell me if I'm horribly off. I think you love the stand-up. You love even movies. You hate everything around it. I saw you on Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee with Jerry Seinfeld mm -hmm. and I felt like you hated it. I didn't hate it. I That was my Dr. Reed of the situation. Whoa. If you were my patient and I was talking to you there, you'd be like... <laughs> I didn't hate it. In those situations, especially with Jerry Seinfeld, who is... That's a guy I grew up watching and really <laughs> admired. I was a little uneasy just because at that time, sometimes you're a little nervous or you're, you have anxiety because oh, okay. you're talking to someone who, you know... Sometimes I'm sitting, I'm in the car with Jerry Simon. I go, I'm in the car with Simon. I was, wow. I was, I was watching this guy in college. Okay. Never did I expect me to be in the car. Uh, so it was an overwhelmed. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of these times I'm in these movies of what, you know, I mean, I was in a movie with Robert De Niro. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, this, I had this guy's poster on my wall. And now, you know, he's, he's playing my father in an upcoming movie that I wrote. It's just sometimes, like, you don't really believe where you're at sometimes. And sometimes, you know, it, it might come out sideways. Okay. So you you are no stranger to feeling overwhelmed and anxiety. Yeah, I have some anxiety and, and being overwhelmed. And uh, like I said, I think the meditation, when I do the meditation, I definitely feel a lot more at ease throughout the day. Mm -hmm. um, but that we haven't mastered that okay. yet. Well, no, I don't think you ever I feel mastered like, yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. That's like a, a human yeah. life goal. Um, so was my initial kind of thought correct about the world outside of stand-up being not your favorite world? Uh, you know, you know, my wife is extremely social. Mm. She loves going out with people, loves having parties. I do too. But, uh, I'm out and about talking to people mm -hmm. for my job. Yep. I'm performing. I'm giving a lot of energy out. Yeah. Yes. I'm taking a lot of energy in, yeah. but ideally I am more of a homebody. I don't travel with an entourage. Yeah. I, uh, so who are the five people? That <laughs> oh, is that not supposed to say? <laughs> Just what? Just what? Um, yeah, I, I tend to be a little bit more, you know, when I got my time off, I'd just rather kind of be with Chill. the people that I really enjoy being with, not not going out. It might be weird to say, but I love that because you're a real human. A lot of times in Hollywood, you get people who really feel like they're the thing and they have to do that. And I don't know if they're putting on a show or that's truly who they are as people. Um, I get confused on what to do around those people because I'm like you. I'm like a homebody that likes to hang out and have conversations. So when people bring that big energy, I'm like, is this them? Is this a medication? Is this them putting on a show? <laughs> is this the medication? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I hear you. Sometimes it's like, is this is this an act? Where's this going? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'd rather sit around and talk about your your uh your purifier that you got going on that's that's setting the room out there. That's that's kind of where I live. <laughs> same. I'm in the same world. Um, there was something I wanted to ask about. Oh, the pediatrician uh, mm -hmm. a conversation we were going back to earlier. I'm a family medicine doc, so I see children, adults, any age can walk into my office, into my urgent care at any moment. To me, I feel like treating children is a lot like being a vet they'll bite you sometimes because they don't know that you're actually helping them. Mm -hmm. They'll sneeze into your mouth. That's a thing that happens. You say, say, ah, and they sneeze. They can't tell you what's wrong with them. You have to diagnose by just looking at the body or doing certain tests. Do you ever feel like that as a parent? Um, like, oh man, how do I figure out what's wrong with my child? I mean, your children are older now, three and five, so earlier. Yeah, I guess earlier, yeah. Um, you know, being a new parent, especially, and not having a 
you know, we had our daughter and it's like, oh, is this, is this something out of the norm? Yeah. Um, is, is she supposed to be breathing this way? Yeah. Um, so yeah, sometimes you're really at a loss. And again, thank God we had a pediatrician that could kind of guide us through these, these moments. I mean, we, we'd call them in the middle of the night, take a video of Serafina. She was breathing, breathing and, and go retractions. This? Yeah. So, so yeah, it, it, it's when it's all new, you don't know what's going on. Yeah. Has that situation resolved with the breathing issues? Yeah, yeah. The breathing oh, issue. So kind of yeah, yeah. Was it an RSV issue? No, it wasn't no. that. I don't know if it was a virus Asthma. at the time that mm. was that was hitting hard, but mm. for her, she had a really tough time with it. And knock mm. on wood, uh, we've we've seen a lot of illness with our children over the last six to eight months in mm. the schools. RSV, yeah. uh, you know, hand, foot, and mouth disease. Yes. Yeah. And again, and I, I was talking to you know Dr. Scott, and I'm like. Growing up, I'm 49. Growing up, I don't remember th all this sickness. Mm -hmm. We got sick once a year. Yep. You had a you had a cold. You blew your nose, and then you went back to school. I don't remember going to school and someone going, "I had hand, foot, and mouth <laughs> disease." Where did that come from? Well, well, we all become uh, microbiologists and immunologists over the pandemic, right? <laughs> everyone's a specialist with their opinion on what's going on i don't know i mean are you seeing yeah i mean you're 32 you're a young guy so you you kind of came up you know uh, 17 years later mm -hmm. but growing up in the 70s and the 80s mm -hmm. i don't remember such a problem yeah with illness in school or maybe i was just not privy to it something happened from the 80s to the 90s i wasn't there i was born in 89 but something happened where let's say, let's take asthma as an example. Asthma prevalence, the amount of people with asthma, developing asthma, in that 10 year span went up 45%. Really? And then over the next 10 years, it went up a little bit and the next 10 years kind of fallen. And the question is what happened during those 10 years that something happened to our immune systems where they started overreacting? Was it we were really keeping our children clean and boiling everything and not letting them play in dirt, you know, that whole philosophy, mm -hmm. the hygiene theory. And I feel like that could be part of it because right now with RSV, one of the leading theories of why there's such a run on hospitals in RSV is because generally kids get RSV in their first three years of life. There's like a 50% chance each year that they get their first episode. And their first episode with RSV is usually the worst. That's when they have like the time that where they need breathing treatments, maybe ICU stay. And we've held our kids back from school and grandparents and everybody that could have gotten them sick for the last two years. Mm -hmm. So now the children that would have gotten it each year have all gotten it at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it was their first time. So it kind of creates a run on hospitals. That's the leading theory. Gotcha. Um, so what's ironic about healthcare and what I try and instill in my YouTube channel, even with my silly videos, is that you can't not get sick and you can't predict everything with healthcare. I'm sure you've been pitched executive health programs where it's like, come in for a scan, we're gonna check everything, we're gonna make sure you're the healthiest person and we're gonna optimize and boost your immune system. Have mm -hmm. you heard something like yeah, that? Yeah. It doesn't exist. Like a, a lot of the shit out there is, is shit. <laughs> Well, in that case, isn't it like if they say, okay, we're going to run a scan or do a test on your heart to see if the arteries are, mm -hmm. you know, what, whatever, if you need medication or whatnot. Yeah. Isn't that some sort of preventative uh, test where, okay, you got 80% blockage, we're going to give you X, Y, Z. Sure. Um, so are you recommending people don't do these preliminary scans or... No, this is why I have to be very careful because it's hard to make generalizations. Preventive care exists. A lot of the time, preventive care is all wrapped up in the same thing, things that take work, you know, exercise, the mindfulness, meditation, the sleep, the social connections, the things that every doctor would recommend, but they've gotten so tired of recommending because no one listens to them mm -hmm. or they get too tired and they don't have time to listen to them. And then they get pitched a shortcut miracle pill that they start doing that instead. But there are certain things prevention is key for when it comes to cancer screenings, vaccinations. We can get ahead of things. Mm -hmm. But then there's a lot of things where the prevention aspect of trying to do something before something happens, which is called a screening, actually can be harmful. And that's why you'll see screenings change over time. Like initially, let's say when I was coming up in my training, we were saying every male above a certain age should get a PSA to check their prostate. Mm -hmm. 
Now we've kind of seen less benefit of doing so and have moved away from saying everyone should get it. And now it's a shared decision-making recommendation where you and I will talk about the risks and benefits of getting the screening for you. And then we decide what to do. Is it, is it the actual screening that's causing the issue or is it what Downstream it does effects. to you psychologically if you find out, oh, I got... I got blockage. Now all of a sudden you're thinking you got blockage and that is is a good it worse. screening needs to be actionable and the problem that it's screening for needs to be preventable. So there's no point screening you for something that I can't act upon. Mm -hmm. You know, they have these like fancy genetic tests. Find out if your risk of Alzheimer's is extremely high and people will pay for this thing. Mm -hmm. And then what? There's nothing I can do for you as a doctor to help you decrease that risk. So now we just raised your anxiety, you have this knowledge, and then we, the same seven recommendations, sleep better, eat better, like there's nothing to do. It's not actionable information. And with a prostate test, what we've seen is then people start going for biopsies unnecessarily because their PSA number was high simply because of their age, their prostate grew, something known as benign uh, hyperplasia of the prostate gland. And they get the biopsy, they get a side effect from the biopsy, now they have issues with urination, erections, and it's like, why did we create this problem mm -hmm. when this wouldn't have extended the person's life? Got it. And there's a lot of times where medicine will do that because it sounds like we have a lot of control. And the answer is we don't. We know just enough to get by in some situations and the rest is ego. So that's why it's important to have a good relationship with a primary care doctor who can tell you what's bullshit, what's not. And what's bullshit and what's not, it differs person to person. Mm -hmm. Like what I may recommend for Sam might be not be the same thing that I recommend for you. And that's why I, I tell everyone, get a good PCP. Do you have a good relationship? Your, pedi your pediatrician friend is probably not your doctor. No, 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 yeah. But, I have a good um, relationship with my primary care physician. And, and, and you know, I, I'm not into a lot of this. I'm into, listen, the only way you're going to live a healthy life is just what you're saying. Diet, exercise, sleep, uh, being mentally um, strong. Mm -hmm. uh, outside of that, I mean, some things are hereditary. You know, I mean, uh, heart disease runs in my family. So, you know, th there's a chance that I might uh, drop dead of a heart attack. Uh, but other than that, I mean, again, if I start hearing stuff that, like this Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. my grandfather died of Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. If I know that I'm prone to Alzheimer's, every day I wake up and I don't remember something, mm -hmm. I'm like, that's it, no memory. Yeah. So it's better off I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, again, only if it would be valuable for you to know. Yes, yeah. yes. Like even like they'll say, get a full body scan. And then- What is a full body scan? What like does that they'll mean? say like, get a full body CAT scan and we'll find early stages of things. But humans have lumps, bumps, nodules that are, who cares? That they, they have no impact on your life. They would have no impact on your life. And now you're A, anxiously aware of this thing. And then B, you gotta follow this thing. What well, doctor is gonna be like, oh, you have a nodule, I'm not gonna follow it. And now you're getting CAT scans every year, radiating your body, creating cancer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you see how easy that can happen? Yeah. Because th there, there's really a thin line between this screening test decreases risk of dying of this cancer versus decreasing your risk of dying, period. Those are very important things mm -hmm. because I can have a test that 100% decreases your likelihood of dying of a certain cancer, but do you know how it works? I kill you in the process. You won't die of the cancer, you're gonna die from me killing you. Yeah. But do you see how I lowered the risk of the cancer dying risk? Yeah. So like you gotta be really careful. That's obviously an exaggeration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't kill anyone. <laughs> um, I wanted to touch on something you mentioned about Lately, it's been called toxic masculinity. I think it's a term that might be misused at times um, where men try and act tough. They don't seek help for their medical problems. They're afraid to talk about their feelings. And to me as a primary care doctor, where I see it pop up is when it comes to mental health, men will show signs of depression in a different way where they will put on that act that we talked about earlier. They'll act tough, they'll be louder, they may abuse substances, they may start gambling, they may start doing these things. What's your take on the state of to toxic masculinity and how people talk about it these days? I mean, I grew up, immigrant father, 
work like a mule, okay. right? I didn't look at that as toxic masculinity. Mm -hmm. I just looked at it as you're a man. He's programmed to work. What He's more emotional now, my father, than he ever was in the past. Mm -hmm. um, it It's different for me because I haven't seen that side of him. But I also like that he's showing those emotions. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes is he in touch with his emotions? You mean, I think, or just show like? Uh, yeah, I mean, my dad is susceptible to crying mm. more often than I saw him growing up uh, exhibit those types of mm -hmm. behaviors. But whatever they're, you know, I think men in general uh, in, in in the past have kind of had the pressure to hold it all together mm -hmm. and not ask for help or not uh, show vulnerability. Um, but I don't think we lose the whole, you know, that, that like my father, I, I, the way I grew up, I would never change that because I got a lot of what I do from him mm -hmm. And if he would have been any different, maybe I wouldn't have, you know, taken those traits of work ethic and, you know, putting your head down and 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 just being a being a. I mean, can you say being a man anymore? Mm -hmm. I mean, is that is there there's there certain characteristics that men have that uh, that make us make us go? Yeah, I think the only thing maybe I could say from my scientific perspective is it's a masculine thing versus feminine. And a masculine mindset could be exhibited by a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of the only approach that I would take slightly differently because I have patients that would exhibit the traits that you're talking about, but they might be a woman. So I could see those things changing. And I think looking at all of those things in a solely negative light, you're going to miss out on a lot of good just like as you're saying, the work ethic example, the discipline, the things that you need to truly achieve something great, you can't throw all that away. But you can improve upon it. And I'm sure there's things your father has done in your life that you're like, okay, I love that he did that. And from that, I took away that I should always work hard and do this, but here's what I'm going to do differently. Yeah. And the new generations approve upon. Is there anything that strikes an example to you of something that you're like, here's what I'm going to improve upon? Um, Maybe as a father. Well, yeah, and, and I don't dis I, I don't at all look down on my father for mm -hmm. not necessarily being there when we were kids because he was working so much. In different times. Yeah, and I said to myself, I go, I want to spend more time with my kids mm. than my dad spent with me at, at, at these ages. So that's definitely something that I've taken and wanted to change. The sensitivity and the emotional part I really got from my mother. Mm. My mother was, you know, that kind of caretaker and, and whatnot. And she exhibited those those qualities. And I think I absorbed a lot of that from from her. So I took, you know, a lot from my mother and my father. And now as I'm starting my own family, I'm going, okay, you know, th there was a sense of uh, a negativity around the house that it was, it was um, not, not that it was all like negative, but it, it you know, sometimes my mother still exhibits it today, and I and I have some of this in me too. Where you know, I'll go, uh, you know, I'm in a movie. Any lines? You know, like, <laughs> you know, it, it's just yeah. like it, whatever. It's it's not good enough of what you're doing. It's always, yeah. you know, uh, and and you know, I I know it's sometimes said in in jest and whatnot, and 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 doesn't mean anything by it, but. Because I think you knew the intention behind it. Mm -hmm. I had the same thing. My dad, I would bring home a 97 on a test and my dad would be like, not a <laughs> hundred? Like, what, what are you doing? <laughs> and I would be like, wow, my dad like thinks I'm terrible. And then like I'll overhear him talking with friends showing off that I got a 97. And I'm sure you had instances of Absolutely. That. You know, I think as a parent too, uh, you always want your kid to excel above and beyond yeah. uh, their ex, uh, or, or at least as a parent, you, your expectations is, they want to, they should get a hundred, you know, and if it, if it falls short, it falls short. But again, that mentality, uh, why didn't you get a 98? You know, I think that breed is dying off. Yeah. You don't really see, you see it, but I see it a lot more in immigrant parents yeah. than I do in, 
in people that were born. I here. just think it needs to be balanced. And that's why I think you're doing a great job, especially merging the both worlds of your parents. So obviously wish you a lot of luck with the the tour. Thank the, you. The Netflix special that just launched today. Yes, that Epic, you saw. Half of. 36 minutes. 36 minutes. And we'll get you up to speed by the end of the I finished on the uh, the zucchini okay. game. All right. For those who haven't watched, they'll enjoy that one. <laughs> um, seriously, huge congrats. Thanks. Thank you for all that you bring and, and being a real human. I, I think it's lost in Hollywood these days, so it's great to see a, a fellow human oh, on I, stage and be as successful as you are. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. I'm about to answer your medical questions because we do that at the end of every podcast episode. If you want to leave a five-star review, I highly appreciate it because it helps the podcast get promotion. And when you do leave a five-star review, make sure you leave a comment with your medical question in the body of the review, just like these users did. Question numero uno. Renee, I donate platelets often and I haven't had too many issues donating until recently. In the past few donations I've done, I've started to become very nauseous and have even passed out for a few seconds in the middle of donation. Why does this happen? How can I prevent this from happening in the future when I donate? It's a good question. Um, well, first of all, like if you're having moments of syncope where you feel like you're passing out, that should always be investigated by a doctor because there's so many different causes for that. And it could be something completely benign, like something to do with the temperature in the room or the fact that you're visualizing the needle and you're having a vasovagal syncope episode, which is basically like your blood pressure drops. So you're not getting enough circulation to the brain. And usually it restores itself quite quickly. Or it could be something more serious, something going on with the neurological system, the heart. So all these things need to be investigated, maybe not with special tests, but with a thorough, thorough history. For a young person, the thing that I would right away want to investigate with my history is making sure that you're not dehydrated, making sure that your blood sugars are stable, because it's very easy in moments of stress to forget that you haven't had enough water or you haven't had enough calories. And as a result, maybe your body misfires a bit and drops your blood pressure and you feel like you're about to pass out. So I would really focus on that um, aspect when, when doing a history, but it's hard for me to know without having you as my direct patient. Um, princess of books. What's the number one thing you wish people in the yoga world knew about medicine? Well, uh, I can't really say that the yoga people don't know about medicine. They probably do. Um, probably to not the same degree as someone who's, uh, a physician in practice, just because of the number of hours we spend in hospitals, seeing diseases, disorders, treating them, etc. The number one thing I wish people in the yoga world knew about medicine. Okay, I think in the yoga world, and also in kind of the alternative medicine world, there is an assumption that doctors don't care about lifestyle factors and immediately jump to pharmaceuticals, medications. And while this could be true in many cases, um, because there are some doctors who do do that, I think the large majority of interactions happen in a way where doctors have tried lifestyle modifications and patients are unable to make those changes, whether it's an issue of circumstance, meaning money, socioeconomic factors, distance, other barriers, um, or discipline even. And then as a result, the doctors are then left no choice but to go down the pharmaceutical route. And as a result, so many patients are on pharmaceutical options and it looks like doctors only recommend those. So I would offer to cut doctors some slack in this regard uh, when it comes to the yoga world. Dave, have you ever had a patient who received a heart transplant? I received one a few years ago and I remember having the most surreal dreams. I'm curious if other patients have experienced this. Dave, I have not ever experienced that with a transplant patient. I don't think I've ever had a cardiac transplant patient. Um, that it, um, Maybe in my um, med student days, I may have overseen one for a brief moment in time, but never heard that specific part of it, the history, that they had wild dreams. Uh, I do have patients who take certain medications that have uh, changes in their dreams. Benadryl is one of the most frequently touted ones where patients get uh, abnormal dreams. Um, Chantix, medication that is used to stop smoking um, as an aid to stop smoking, um, can cause some abnormalities in dreams, but never, never with the transplant. Great question, though, Dave. Appreciate you. Uh, look, thanks for listening. Uh, I really appreciate all of you. As always, stay happy and healthy.